There are a few things in life more pleasant and more fulfilling than to be pleasantly surprised by something. Be it like a movie you just picked out on a whim because the title sounded interesting, you met a new person, your new job went a lot better than you thought it were, what, whatever it is you want to look at, going into something with no expectations or low expectations and having it be good or even great is just a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun and it's a very pleasant experience. And sometimes you go in with no expectations and it sucks. It sucks, it's terrible, you wish you never even fired it up. But other times you pop it in and it's, it's something truly great. And it's just always an uh, exceptional experience. And today's uh, anime falls into that category. Oshi no Ko, or My Idol, I've also seen it translated as My Star. So this has been a big thing in Japan for a while now. I believe it was a manga. I don't know if there was a light novel or not. I get confused sometimes because oftentimes there is a light novel, then there's a manga, then there's the anime. So it's a chicken and the egg type situation. But it's been a big thing in Japan came out there was a lot of fanfare i i don't really pay that much attention to whatever the online anime community is or whatever but someone's like argent you got to give this a try you got to watch oshi no ko at least watch the first episode which is kind of like a short movie or that's like um a feature length episode like it's an hour or whatever and then decide if you want to watch more or not i'm like you know what why not it's made apparently by the same guy who did Love is War, which I really disliked, but this appears to not be the case. This, but this is completely different. This is way, way better in my opinion. So, that being said, oat ice cream, that, that does not sound very good. Um, <laughs> so, Oshi no Ko is an anime about idols. And I knew nothing about idols uh, in Japan. It's not something I've ever been particularly interested in. I'm not Japanese. I like anime. I don't really follow other aspects of their pop culture that much. So I really had no idea what it even it, it even was. All I knew that Rize was an idol in um, Persona 4. And this thing gives a really good view into what things are like in the entertainment industry. And just kind of what a sleazy disaster the whole thing is. <laughs> Which I like. Anything that exposes the entertainment industry for what they are, I, I think is, is something good. Because there's a lot of just... I mean, we had Epstein, we had Weinstein. Um, you have all the just stories about kids getting molested in Hollywood. Just sex trafficking, horrific shit. And anything that exposes the entertainment industry and shines a light on it, I think, is a good thing. Uh, before we get into the plot, maybe just a bit more about uh, that. I didn't know how bad idols were treated in Japan. It's, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the concept of a company town. So what used to happen, and this still happens in some places, is a company would buy a mine or a factory or something... And then they would also build all the housing. They'd run the general store and everything else. So people would work at the mine. And then they would sell the product, the, the stuff they produced to the company, often at a rather poor rate. And then the company would deduct from their, um, their housing, their equipment. Um, they'd have to buy their food from the company store at premium rates. And what would often happen is the more people would work, the higher their debt load would be. And then you just get into a kind of a form of debt slavery. There's the old song, I sold my soul to the company store. And that apparently is how the idol industry works in Japan. And I would imagine Korea is similar. Wherein they, the people who run the idols um, take the vast majority of their paycheck. But on top of that, they bill them for everything. So if they need dancing lessons, singing lessons, stuff like that, that's not provided. Sure, you're an employee, but you that's personal development. So you have to pay for that yourself. Their outfits, they have to pay for themselves. 
um, even though like they're told that they have to, I guess, imagine you have to continually get new ones. Um, I think a lot of just production and miscellaneous expenses, like I don't think their hotels are paid for and stuff like that. So you have a situation where you have people who make, I forget how much um, I made, but it was a very, it was a tiny amount of money for the amount that she brought in. And then of that, basically all of it was taken by these people. And I don't even know if she was breaking even at the end of the month or she was having to go into debt with her employer. Now that's something I feel pretty strongly about. I think if you're not an independent contractor, um, everything you need to do your job should be provided by your employer um, or reimbursed. So like, if you need a uniform, your employer should provide that. If you need specific tools, um, training, stuff like that, I think your employer should have to provide that. Apparently that's not the case in the idol industry. And given that's the entertainment industry, I can't say I'm surprised. This show also takes aim at the uh, acting industry, although to somewhat of a lesser extent. But it's also completely and, and utterly horrible. Like I said, I complain about office work and white collar work. That has nothing on working in the entertainment industry from everything I've ever seen about it. Anyway, so let's get into Oshinoko. What is this show about? So we have a doctor and his patient. Um, the patient is like a, a little girl. Doctor's obviously an adult. I think he was one of the top graduates out of Tokyo U. A uh, guy with like a genius level intellect. And they kind of bond together. The girl has terminal cancer. I think it's terminal cancer. I forget the exact details. But they're both big fans of idols, particularly this idol named Ai, who's viewed as being a once-in-a-generation talent. Now, they both get killed, and they get reincarnated as Ai's twins. Um, Aqua is the male one, and Ruby is the female one. Now, it's kind of interesting because Ai's has sparkles in both of her eyes, Aqua has it in one side, Ruby has it on the other. And despite being Japanese, they're both like Aryan gods. Because this is anime, and that's just that just seems to be something that happens. But anyways, they're both the children of eyes. They have all their memories from the previous life. Over the course of the show, they don't figure out that the previous per the other person is somebody they knew in their past life. But they're very happy uh, being Ai's children. Ai decides to keep them. She has to keep it a secret, though, because it, there's, like, idols aren't allowed to date people because they have to be, I guess, the female equivalent of a fake cell for their fans to, to so they can have hope that they might be able to be their boyfriend or, or something like that. Honestly, all these girls should just go on Twitch. That was the problem I had with Rent-A-Girlfriend, is Jizuru could just go on Twitch and, and make way more money. So I, I don't really get that aspect of the show. But I digress. So I gets killed pretty early on by a, a crazy fan. And Aqua is determined that he is going to figure out who killed his mom. He's going to hunt him down, he's going to kill him, and he's going to get revenge. And Aqua is so dedicated to this that he has Ai's phone. Uh, it's like an iPhone, so it has the four number password. Or is it five or six? Anyways, it was a bunch of numbers. But he spends the f like um, years of his life typing in uh, every possible number sequentially. Um, now, this is one of the phones where if you enter it wrong three times then you have to hold off for like five minutes but he does this basically all day every day until he opens her phone and then he gets some information and finds out it's another guy in the industry and so aqua's kind of master plan over season one he's going to figure out who killed his mom and he's going to um kill the guy and get his uh revenge aqua is kind of a sigma male wherein he just kind of does whatever he wants. And because he was like a genius doctor in his previous life, 
he's way, way smarter than anyone would expect from a teenager. So he normally succeeds in, like, whatever his master plan is. Um, I don't really know how to feel about Aqua. On one hand, he is a very cold and calculating person. On the other, most of what he does tends to turn out well for the parties involved. Like, he'll do things, but it'll wind up being, like, a positive outcome. It's something that'll make everybody happy, or everybody winds up better in the end. But it's done for pragmatic purposes. And you almost have to wonder, like, are the mo is Aqua, like, a, both a pragmatist and a decent person? Or is he just a, a pure pragmatist who doesn't care about other people than his maybe his sister and I? And that's what he... Um, the path he wants to go down. So, Aqua has some brief experience as a child actor. Um, he's known for being an immensely talented actor. Uh, and he periodically does acting jobs throughout the series. He's a Sigma male, so he doesn't really care about society's approval. Instead, his main goal is to get revenge. Uh, and he only really takes acting jobs if it helps him to get closer to figuring out who killed his um, mom, so he can get revenge on them. He cuts a bunch of deals with, like, some sleazy director that if he does shows for him, then he'll be able to, um, get information about the person who might have killed his mom. Um, so, that's Aqua. Uh, Ruby doesn't really get that much screen time, at least not in season one. Um, she really wants to become an idol. So after I died, the um, wife of her manager adopted both of them. I'm, I think Ruby calls her mom, but they're a lot closer than Aqua is to um, is to her. Probably because in her previous life she was a kid, so she doesn't have as much of an adult perspective to believe to to kind of begin with and her probably a development is a lot more normal even if she is exceptionally smart for her age now ruby really really wants to be an idol it's her dream it's all she really wants to do and aqua being the sigma male he is is just like look my sister is this super cute blonde naive teenager girl and i know what's gonna happen she's gonna get raped I know this is Japan, but I'm sure you know who will find a way to go there and um, and do things to her. Um, I'm just going to sabotage her career by threatening people or otherwise screwing up her auditions. Um, because I know that she's very talented, at least as a dancer, and very charismatic, even though her singing is apparently atrocious. But I'm going to try to destroy her career because I don't want my sister to get molested. Um, which is kind of base, to be honest. Like, he does this as, like, a G-slur op on the down low <laughs> for a lot of the series. When he eventually allows her to become an idol, it's in the context of, um, their adopted mother, uh, restarting their idol division. After I died, um, their band, uh, her band eventually broke up, and they hadn't done any idol group since then. However, because I, um, so Ak was okay with that because he knows, like, her mother is going to give her a fair deal. She's not going to sexually exploit her and, and stuff like that. So part of the context of season one is Aqua and Ruby go to this high school that's, I think it's very high admission standards, but it's also for, um, kids who are trying to make it in the entertainment industry be it as models or actors or musicians or or something like that. Um, and this is where we get introduced... Well, we get introduced before, but we get introduced to probably my favorite character in the show, Kana. Now, Kana is a child actress who is extremely talented and extremely popular. She was, however... It's a combination that she was spoiled and praised but also not given any real affection or had close relationships with people, kind of made her a nasty person when she was a little kid, as she was exceedingly arrogant and rude to everybody. 
Because everyone kept telling her how talented she was, that she was like the most talented child actor of her generation, um, and stuff like that. But because, like, the, the behavior she had was okay as a little kid, but as she got older, people didn't want to work with her anymore. Uh, her agent threw her under the bus, her mother abandoned her, and she was left as a former child star. She tried to make a career as a singer, and as we can see in the show, she's actually exceedingly talented at it. And, and like, didn't just do what some actors would do, where they just have a singing career and, and coast in on their fame. She was actually very skilled at doing it, spent a lot of time learning how to sing properly, but her singing career went nowhere. She barely has any jobs these days. She doesn't really have any dedicated fans. And I think we like Kana a lot, and I was actually surprised, happy, uh, I was happy to find out that a lot of other people like her a lot. But I think all of us have had self-esteem issues. All of us have been in a position where we, we beat ourselves up, we have trouble dealing with our failures, and I think the bigger issue isn't so much accepting that you're bad at something, but accepting that you're good at something for someone with low self-esteem. Because Kana's just tried really, really hard to make it, but no one's been there for her. No one's provided her with any support in years. And her career is just stumbling despite her great talents. And she's, I like her a lot because she's undergone a lot of character development. Uh, she's become a much more humble person, a much nicer person, someone with very low self-esteem and who is very self-doubting. But unlike a lot of characters like that, there's a reason for it that's very well established, and she's just very sympathetic. Now, she's one of Aqua's two potential love interests. I'm pretty sure she'll be the last girl, uh, just because her and Aqua appear to be a lot closer than the other girl who's his fake GF. But Akko kind of, like, helps her come out of her shell. He tries to kind of support her. A lot of it, though, is in the context of manipulating her so he can get what, she wa what he wants. So, like, there's a bunch of cool stuff that happens in Season 1. Aqua uh, has a cameo role in a uh, manga t uh, series that didn't do very well until the last episode because Kana and him came on and they were the only two people who could act. And Aqua helped her film like a scene that really took advantage of her talents. So they did really well in that one scene. And that kind of helped Kana get back in the game a bit. Um, and part of his, his master plan is an idol group can't just be one person. Uh, he also meets this other girl who is actually a Twitch star. Um, who's a Twitch star during a show, a teenage, like, reality rom, romantic drama show that he was doing. Um, so he succeeds in getting her and Kana to agree to be on the idol team with Ruby. He's like, okay, I guess Ruby's gonna be an idol one way or another. I'm gonna get, like, two people I know are stand-up girls. I was gonna say stand-up dudes, but... Who are just good people who I trust with my sister, who I know aren't going to screw around with her, who are going to be solid. So he recruits Kana, and I forget what the other girl's name is. Um, Kana feels really bad about it. She feels like it's a step down, and she'll have trouble being taken seriously as a an actor. And Aqua just says it's time to reinvent reinvent yourself. You still have a lot of talent. This is an opportunity to kind of get back in the game. And Kana eventually agrees. There's a part where they're trying to get, decide who's going to be the, the lead of the band, of the, uh, the idol group. And Ruby and the other girl are both idol otakus. They really want it. But they eventually figure out that Kana's by far the most talented of them. At least when it comes to singing. She's a professional. Um, she's just much better like she's in much better shape because dancing like that it takes a lot out of you um and she's kept herself in good shape um so she'll be good she'll for her acting career um she also once again practices singing so as the only member of the group who can actually sing they decide to make her the 
the front. So they get their idol group back. They name it B. Kamachi after the uh, group that I was part of because it's founded by the same company. And the season one ends with them having their first concert. Um, Kana rediscovers her passion and she decides that she's going to put her all into being an idol. And she's going to get fans and she's going to try to get her life back on track. And maybe I'm talking a lot about Kana rather than Aqua Ruby. Ruby doesn't really do that much in this season, but I like her character development a lot. And I think she's someone that a lot of people relate to once again, because she is someone who has a lot of talent, but someone who is also very self-deprecating and full of self-doubt. And I think most of us, particularly during your teenage years, have been there. Um, so you just kind of have these multiple stories. You have Ruby's quest to become a, uh, idol. She's a really nice, sweet girl. Um, Kana goes through who character art. You also have Akane, who is a, um, was on the reality dating show that Aqua was on. And she, I think she gets mad and slaps somebody or something like that. And that gets recorded and put on the internet. And... She just gets flamed by everybody and everyone tells her to go kill herself and stuff like that. And she gets just so depressed from being flamed online that she actually does try to kill herself. And then Aqua goes in and saves her. And then Aqua's going to be her fake boyfriend to help both of their careers. And just a lot of fun stuff happens. But the show, for something like it, it's a standing, which I'm kind of surprised given the age of the characters, but... The writing is just very top-notch. Music's really good. Animation style's really good. Art style's really good. It's just I wasn't expecting something with the premise of, like, two people are reincarnated as the children of an idol to be this, like, good. To, to have this much effort put into it. To have well-developed, well-written characters. So... Overall, I think Oshinoko is really good. It might not be for anyone, everyone, but I really enjoyed every moment of the first 11 episodes. And I'm looking forward to season two. I'm looking forward to them producing more of this. Because if it's any indication, it's going to be... It could make it into my top 20, maybe even my top 10. Uh, I don't think it's for everybody. A lot of people might not like the themes or the, the subject matter. But once again, I, I give it a try. It's something that I did not expect to like. Um, it's something I didn't expect to be interested in. Um, but I wound up really getting engaged and really getting involved with the characters. And like I said, give it a try, even if it's something that you probably wouldn't normally be interested in. Uh, just watch the first episode, which is kind of like a... 60 minutes special or something. I forget if it was 40 or 60 minutes, but it's it's longer. So Oshinoko, my idol or my star, it gets the big uh, thumbs up. God bless everybody, and I'll talk to you all real soon.